please welcome <laughs> Mr. Rob Hurst. <laughs> I should give you a kiss, really. <laughs> Not many people know this, Rob, but, but you came to drumming basically through illness, didn't you? Tell us uh, about I, your first I, drum I, Yeah, I did. Uh, when I was about 13, um, after a long stint in hospital with this benign tumour that I had in my right leg, um, the first thing I did uh, when I got back was ask for a drum kit. And um, mum and dad went to Harry Landis in Park Street in Sydney and they bought this hideous star drum kit from old Harry yeah. uh, with this volcanic kind of finish and um, brought it home mm -hmm. soon after I was in hospital and, um, and uh, I attacked it immediately. Yep. I was so excited by this. Yeah. And my, but my leg hadn't really healed. Was it what, it had been broken? Well, it had been or? in a, uh, one of those Crimean War casts oh, for years, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. the old ones where yeah, you yeah. sort of, yeah. Yep. And it's kind of rolled to the side while I was in Royal North Shore Hospital. Yep. Uh, and they said, well, um, take it easy on the leg. And of course, yeah, right. There's a drum kit there. Yeah, yeah. I've been laid up for three months. <laughs> what am I going to do, you know? So um, I attacked the drum kit yep. uh, with the result that I I pressed the foot pedal so hard and so often for yep. those weeks after that uh, my foot healed in a funny way. So today, even my my foot actually naturally walks out that way. So it's really made for the for it's the perfect for the drum, drum kit. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Right. Yeah, so it was like a genetically modified drummer. <laughs> Good thing you're not a dancer. You'd just be dancing off stage <laughs> right, all the time. Right. <laughs> Exit stage right. Yeah. We have a bit of footage here of uh, <laughs> of your work in the band at work. Uh, this is, uh, of course, the famous hit "Power and the Passion." <laughs> Right. <laughs> Nobody had good hair in the 80s. That's right, we have an 80s yes. Now, I've got to ask, the first time the band <coughs> saw Peter Garrett dance, did you all just stop playing and freak out? <laughs> well, we'd already seen uh, Joe Cocker dance, so yeah. we thought, oh, that's just what, you know, lead singers do. So. Did you think he'd stepped on an electrical wire? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was unique. Yeah. You know, the voice was unique. The yeah. presence was, was unique. He was a charismatic man. Yep. He was a surfer yes. then. And, he had uh, long blonde hair, didn't he? He did, yeah. And he arrived um, to the audition yeah. in a Peugeot 404 with uh, hamburger wrappers in the bottom, you know, about a foot deep. Yep. And um, he sang um, a, uh, unique, a unique version of Locomotive Breath, that song by Jethro Tull. Oh, really? Yeah, in a high falsetto. Really? Yeah. Peter? Yeah. And I used to... God, I wish I was taped really, that audition. Yeah, I used to sing really high. And um, we had a couple of other folks come out and audition, and mm. after the um, audition, I said to Jim afterwards, and I said, these other guys can actually sing, but Pete's got this special something. <laughs> whatever, what, whatever happens in the future, no one is going to forget this guy. That's, and that's entirely true. You, you mentioned his singing, actually. You are one of the main songwriters for the band. 25 years, <clears throat> you come from a strong songwriting tradition. Did it ever frustrate you writing songs for a guy that essentially wasn't a singer? Um, yeah, at times it was kind of tough. Um, particularly when Burns Hillman joined the band, uh, Bones got the job as a bass player, but we also because we knew that he could sing. Yeah. In that great tradition of New Zealand singers like Neil Finn yeah. and Fru Dragon and way back. Yep. And um, so we figured that we could, if we could strengthen all the chorus vocals, if I could step up to the microphone, you know, and yeah. Bones could sing, yep. and Jim could also add the odd harmony, yeah. we could have the best of both worlds. We could have Pete's character. Um, vocal. Yes. <laughs> and, and we could have all the melody provided by the rest of us. I like the way you call it character vocal. Character like vocal. Yeah, a vocalist. Yeah. Pete uh, is hard to forget. A very memorable performer. This is footage of you. This is a very famous concert in the streets of New York uh, protesting against the Exxon Valdez. This also from the 80s. Like that gives you an idea of the trooper that Pete is. Okay, yeah. He falls off a PA stack at a lunch hour in Manhattan, Doesn't climbs stop right back yeah. up. Did that happen often? Um, we had a few accidents over the years. Yeah, yeah Jim once in um, Geelong 
um, didn't realise where the end of the stage was. You know, <laughs> you've done a show and you've been blinded by the lights. Yeah. He's walking off with the guitar and actually poleaxed off <laughs> about four metres with his Gibson still on and sort of stuck in the earth. <laughs> and the crew actually had to sort of dig him out. Yeah. yeah. Actually, it wasn't that funny because he cracked a few ribs and... Um, oh, it was funny. Come on. It wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> You're more punk than punk. You're trashing your own band members. You've, read, you, you've written a book, uh, okay. which is extraordinary for a drummer, because you know all the drummer <laughs> jokes. Willie's Bar and Grill about touring. And uh, I didn't realise that you always played some very hairy gigs, including the Hells Angels. We did, yeah. We were, we were told to attend, not invited. We were told to <laughs> attend um, the Hells Angels uh, family-friendly gig at Broadford in Victoria. Yeah. This is way back. Yeah. Uh, and... Um, so we arrived dutifully on the day, yeah. and um, it was like a scene out of Apocalypse Now, the final scene with lots of bodies <laughs> hanging from trees and <laughs> fires and... The horror, the horror. That's right. Yes. And there were women with um, chains, you know, and beards and, you know, stuff. Yes. stuff. <laughs> and uh, we, were, we were backstage and um, <laughs> Mr Ball Bearing, or Mr Bearing to us and Ball to his friends, was the... Uh, <laughs> Master of Ceremonies. Right, yes. And um, he said, right, you've got um, 45 minutes and uh, I'll be at the back of the stage and uh, when you see me lift my little finger, that's when you stop. <laughs> said, right. So we played um, an hour and a half show in 45 minutes. Yes. <laughs> we played the fastest version of Powderworks we ever had. Yeah. And after every song, I was looking around and seeing if Mr. Bering <laughs> had raised his finger. Yeah. And eventually he did. Yeah. And... Um, we had a little uh, American tour manager, Constance, at the time, and she was terrified because she'd learnt that um, the Hells Angels Entertainment that afternoon had been waiting for, for women to approach those port loos which yes. were lined up, and then rolling them down the hill while the women were still <laughs> uh, yeah. so, so it was a family day. It was a family nice, yeah. friendly, yeah. <laughs> and um, so um, she was kind of anxious to get out of there. So yes. as soon as we got out, you know, we got in the Commodore. Yep. This was before Tarago's. Yes. And we fishtailed out of it. <laughs> really? Just, just while we heard um, Mr. Baring on the PA going, um, he said, um, he didn't say, did you like midnight oil? He said, do you reckon we got good value out of midnight oil? <laughs> and we're in the car going, because yeah. you know, we, we were still on this side of the gate. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and the crowd who were just completely drug fucked. Yeah. You know, just, yep. <laughs> it's after 9.30, isn't uh, it? That's yeah, fine, that's yeah. right. <laughs> they all went, yeah! You know, and they said, right, we'll bring the strippers back on. Ah. <laughs> it was a quality <laughs> gig. Yeah. You've also managed to antagonise some people. In Vancouver Island, after you'd done a concert, you were met on a bridge by some not-so-happy fans. We did, yeah. Um, on occasions, our attempts to save the last um, Redwood in America met with some opposition with some of the local loggers and their families. Yeah. On this occasion, we'd, um, we'd got some light planes up to a place called Tofino, which is on... Vancouver Island, and uh, a company there were clear felling, and we thought that was a really lousy idea. And a lot of local people and Greenpeace people as well, plus the local uh, Indian community, yep. also thought it was a really bad idea. Yeah. So we did this dawn concert, and after the concert, um, we we had to get out of there. Except um, uh, the loggers' families decided that we weren't going anywhere, and um, we had Gary, our manager's young son in the car as well, and he was kind of freaking out a bit. Yeah. And um, they were rocking the car, and it was gradually rocking harder and harder as if they were gonna, it was going to be pushed flat. You were on a bridge? Uh, right? No, where, where, oh, no, just... we were, we're, actually, we're actually wedged in by um, the community. Oh, right. And there were people lying down, so we couldn't go any further. You and... sure they weren't just angry that you played at that hour of the morning? <laughs> That's right, <yeah. laughs> No, we were angry that we played that time. And, um, you know, to be honest, I could... I could see both sides of the equation, you yeah. know, because it was their livelihood and we were Australians, we weren't even locals, you yeah. know. But we felt still that there was enough community support to say that there are other ways of logging yeah. um, than clear felling. And actually after this action that we did, and, and lots of actions by the local wilderness societies and Greenpeace, they started selectively logging. Yeah. That is, they'd get these big choppers and they would take them out one by one out of the trees so that they, the area wasn't devastated. How did you get out of there? Did you talk your way out by saying, yes, I can see your side of the story? <laughs> <laughs> the, cops, the cops and the Mounties surrounded the car. Right. And basically, really? you know. Wow. But they, everyone was yelling friendly things at us, like, get the hell out of our community. And Oh, well, that's nice. Yeah. I Another mean, you know, family. Friendly day. locals. Yeah, there that's you right. Go. One of the DJs as you're travelling in America in your book refers to you as complaint rockers. 
which is a very interesting <laughs> phrase. Uh, did you ever tire, did the Oils ever tire of being a worthy band? Did you ever just well, want to take the piss sometimes? Well, we weren't a worthy band all the time. Yeah. That's the thing. And one of the reasons that I was interested in getting this diary down, Willie's Bar and Grill, was to bring out the humour in the band. Because yeah. the, the Midnight Oil I know is the one where, you know, um, Bones is telling all these one-liners and Martin's being really dry yeah. and, and, and Jim's telling these great stories. And, and that's the camaraderie that I know. But in the public eye, it was, it was something different. It was like we were 24-7 activists. Yeah, it, it seemed like that. I mean, did you ever were. write a song for the hell of it? Like, you know, some animals deserve to be eaten, something like that. <laughs> That's not a bad time, <laughs> that's actually. Right. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Long-nosed Potteroo. Yeah, that's right. Like that, yeah. Nice stew of Potteroo there. <laughs> that's Because right. I reckon that the problem with being the Oils is a lot of bands come off stage and they get groupies and they might get, you know, some, a quickie. But you come off the stage and you get a two-hour intense discussion about solidarity in Nicaragua. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, well, the greenie groupies were a different kind. Yeah. And the political groupies, you know, they were, they'd come back and they'd discuss Jabaluka. Yeah. And they'd discuss... Um, um, you know, a uranium mine somewhere in, a, in the United States that should be stopped. Yeah. And there were members of the band that just wanted to party. Yeah. But they were blocked by Willie, who actually, the Willie in the book is Willie McGuinness, yeah. who's our American tour manager of 15 years standing. Yeah. And he did a... <laughs> <laughs> this is the last show of the ABC. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 I think, I, I think that's all that's left of Renee this is, Rifkin. Right. <laughs> this, is like, this is like doing a show in Eastern Europe, you know, bits of paint falling on. Um, so Willie, Willie wouldn't let the band party. So Willie, uh, Willie uh, was zealous in keeping um, attractive young women that might like to have an intense philosophical discussion <laughs> yes. with the band after the show. About endangered oh, way, yeah. Oh, I and see. also the women that did finally get through were usually confronted by a whole lot of clammy middle-aged blokes changing and it was not a pretty sight. No, no, that, that definitely isn't. Did, uh, do you reckon your fans cared as much about what you were singing about as you did or were they just there? I've been to some of those concerts and I didn't see a lot of discussion about issues. <laughs> I saw a lot of this. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Um, I think, I guess, some did and some didn't. Some people just like the sonic charge of the band or yeah. the, the kick of my bass drum, which interrupts the, you know, the heart patterns. Yeah, yeah. Or just the volume or the excitement of the gig or just want to see Pete do his thing because yeah. he's such a great performer or, you know, and other people took the albums home and dissected every word. We, we have a group of um, uh, intense fans that talk to each other in the internet called the Powder Workers. Yep. And uh, I've actually never logged on because I'm kind of frightened by what they talk about. You know, it's just far <laughs> too intense. But, um, yeah, some people got right into everything we did and yeah. tracked the band and came to the concerts and then immediately got home and logged on and, you know, Rob was wearing this shirt and what did Jim mean when he flicked that pick out into the audience and hit that girl in the eye? Yeah, that kind of, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know. He meant was, sue me. Yeah, that's yeah. right. It was, it was overly dissected. Yeah. You said people wanted to see Pete. I mean, we're talking about Pete a lot. Yeah. Now, Pete left the band, of course, after uh, this most recent tour. Actually, sorry to correct you, he actually left halfway through the last Australian leg ah. of the Capricornia tour. So we still had four weeks to go. So the hardest part was to actually, for us, was to play the last month of shows uh, knowing that Pete was... He leaving. hadn't physically left, he'd told you he was going to leave. That's you, right. You weren't yeah. there as a covers band, so <laughs> just doing the instrumental. No, there are a few around, I think. Yeah. Because bands are notorious for being, they're like a marriage. And I wonder when Pete left, was it like falling in and out of love with somebody? You could see it coming, but it still hurt? I think it's affected people in different ways. I mean, I, I, you mentioned marriage. I don't think you can be in what we were, a six-way marriage, because I always include Gary Morris, our manager, yeah. as a band member. Uh, he played the telephone and we played instruments. But basically, <laughs> he was a member. Yeah. I don't think you can be in something like that where you go directly from school, or actually, in our case, from early uni courses, which were ditched in favour of the band, yeah. and then spend all your life up until now with the same group of people in this uh, quite unreal situation of... of um, of struggle and then success and then seeing the whole thing in a way slip away. And yeah. what was happening in the 90s for Midnight Oil, I think was we made a decision in the early 90s that if we continued the rate of touring, we were just going to explode. Yeah. You know, there's going to be no oils, there's going to be bits of Midnight all over the wall. And so we decided, we pulled out for about seven or eight years and we came home and we had young families and we just decided, you know, we'd do that. So by the time the Capricornia album came, you know, we were decided we wanted to get back and meet our audience again, see if there are any left. 
And then 9-11 happened and we yeah. nearly cancelled. We didn't know whether to go or not to go. Yeah. And we didn't know whether there'd be people there at the gigs. We didn't know whether, because um, a, a lot of bands cancelled, whether we should be there at all, particularly with songs like US Forces and yeah. My Country Right or Wrong, yeah. Namaste Day and Forgotten Years and all these songs. And it turned out to be this amazing tour because we arrived in Los Angeles three weeks after the terrorist attacks. And by then, it was obvious that people had decided they just want to go out and dance. Yeah. And, you know, they were throwing down consolation grog and comfort food at the rate of knots. And we had one of the best tours we ever, we ever had. So yeah. I guess the moral of the story is to, you know, is to just go and do it. Party on. Party on, on as, in true as, Wayne's world style. As, as Willie McGinnis yeah. would say, yeah. Now that Pete's gone, uh, and look, <clears throat> I think you should fess up to this. I, I, I saw what was going on. It's no coincidence that Pete stepped aside at the same time as John Farnham stopped touring. <laughs> he is coming across to the band, isn't he? Yeah. Th <laughs> Now's the time. Uh, that's it. right, yeah. Look, um, you know, John's welcome, you know. <laughs> he's, got a, he's got a brilliant voice. Mm-hmm. He's... Um, you don't have to be diplomatic. He's experienced. <laughs> yeah. I'm just... Talking it up. <laughs> is, there a, is, there a is there a future for the oils? I mean, obviously, well, um, John will be we one. We can't be Midnight Oil without Pete. Yeah. Having said that, the songwriters are still in Midnight Oil. Mm. The instrumentalists are still in Midnight Oil. Mm. The camaraderie and that friendship and that chemistry is still Midnight Oil. Yeah. And um, as such, we want to go and make music. Whether that music ever comes out, whether it sounds like the old Midnight Oil, whether we ever play live again, or just end up like those... <coughs> English bands that, you know, hide in studios and never go out or yeah. whatever. I don't know, yeah. but I know that I want to play um, music again with uh, Jim and Martin and Bones. Well, I very much look forward to hearing 40,000 watts of your The Voice. <laughs> Rob Hurst, thank you very much. <laughs>